These days, the internet is full of videos about building a server from an old PC, and it's always the same story. Just get some old hardware, install Linux, and off you go. It's so simple, anyone can do it. It's so simple, even your dog can do it. So simple, in fact, that even your cat can do it without your dog's help. But what about doing something different? Something special? Something that no man has ever done before? How about building a server from an old server? And you know what? I've got the perfect candidate just for that. Now at the time of making this video, this gorgeous IBM System X 3400 tower server is almost 15 years old. It has an amazing spacious case, which is almost twice as long as any standard desktop. It has three 5 and a quarter inch drive bays, as well as eight hot swappable SAS drive bays. But due to the age, we won't be reusing most of the original components. The CPU, motherboard and RAM combo is terribly slow and power hungry, as you can imagine. Additionally, the system is not standard ADX, so we will need to do some modifications for it to accept modern components. But before we go ahead and strip all of the old stuff out, I thought I'd give you a quick tour of what the system comes with and see if it even works. You can see we've got a big redundant power supply that we'll sadly have to get rid of. We also see some bulging bursting capacitors, so my hopes of this motherboard even posting are not very high. We've got a single CPU socket populated, a PCI-X network card, three hot swappable fans, two SAS backplane boards, and a pad at disk reader up front. We'll be keeping the old caddies to reuse them later. But since I'm already on the side, might as well get the CD drive out and put it where it belongs. Naturally, this server has no HDMI, so I'm using this cheap VGA to HDMI adapter to get it connected to my screen. Let's give this beast some power and see what happens. No, no, it's not on yet. That's literally just the PSU fan buzzing. We still need to press the power button, remember? Wow, it's terribly noisy, even with the fans on low speed. It takes absolutely forever to post. Although, at least there seems to be some activity on the motherboard and, hey, it does actually post. That's one hell of a slow memory scan. Although we do have a whopping 4 gigabytes, that ought to be enough for anybody, right? Right? Anyway, now it's trying to boot via Ethernet, but you get the point. It sort of works. To be honest, it's kind of impressive considering the horrid state of the capacitors, but regardless, this is the last time this motherboard will ever be powered on. Time for disassembly. <sighs> I start off by removing the PSU. So a shout out to IBM here for providing detailed instructions on how to do just that. First the dummy module comes out, and then the main module comes out. I said, the main module comes out. Ah, I see. 
whoever installed this PSU module mashed it in so roughly, one of the guide pins got bent. Eh, no big deal. Nothing some percussive maintenance can't fix. And out it comes. Next up we get rid of the screws that hold the modular PSU, as well as the connectors. Nothing too complex here. The PSU frame can then be removed, and underneath we can see where all the RAM has been hiding. Now that we've got decent access to everything, let's start removing the various layers of parts to get to the motherboard, starting off with the fan assembly. Just as the PSU module, the fan assembly too is incredibly sturdy, and also weighs a ton. And so do these hot swappable miniature jet engines which are 38mm thick. The IDE cable then gets unplugged and goes straight into the trash. I will definitely not be reusing this. Disappointingly, the dual Ethernet adapter is PCI-X, which means mm, I won't be able to reuse it with any motherboard made in the last 10 years. We then take out the IBM server RAID cache card and battery, after which the motherboard simply slides out with the help of this lever. Having never worked on a tower server like this, it's incredible how modular it actually is. With the motherboard out, I remove the I.O. shield, and the SAS backlane boards are also removed. Now that the case is out of the way, we can work more closely on the motherboard. The board must be removed from the metal backplate as we will be reusing the backplate later. And to remove the board, we just need to unscrew about a dozen screws. The CPU heatsink brackets are also sadly screwed down into the backplate, so that means they also need to go. With the last screw out, the motherboard can then at last be lifted off from the backplate, which concludes our disassembly. And now we come to the most complicated part of this entire operation, the case modding. And the motherboard backplate is the first thing that needs tweaking. I've got the small ATX motherboard to use for testing and reference. And you can see here that the CPU socket support spring thingies, as well as the CPU standoffs, are in the way. So getting rid of them all is today's inaugural modification. Thankfully, some of the motherboard standoffs do match ATX mounting holes, so that already saves me a lot of work. Next I remove the PCI card retainer, all the accessories, the remaining side panel, and then drilled out the rivets holding the I.O. frame, as this part will need to be modified. The main reason for taking it out is that the I.O. shield is non-standard. Additionally, we need to make space for one more PCI slot because, um, IBM. Anyway, it's not all as bad as it looks at first glance. At least the bottom height of the existing cutout does seem to sort of match the ATX standard, so I'll be using that as my reference. I check what the official ATX I.O. shield dimensions are online, compare that to the I.O. shield from my reference motherboard, and then mark and cut off a bit of material to enlarge the I.O. shield cutout. Once the cut is done, I get rid of all the sharp edges and adjust the fit until the I.O. shield pops neatly into the hole. Here you can see that while the shield now fits well height-wise, we need to adjust the cutout further, so I repeat all the previous steps as before to make more space on the left side. And after some additional fiddling, it fits perfectly. And the modular sliding mechanism still works too. The next step was to create space for an additional PCI slot, 
For that, I've marked approximately how much space we'll need for a new slot, and I then used the rotary tool again to cut off the marked section. We then need to cut out some material for the PCI bracket to fit on the other side of the case. Here I mark off how long the slot needs to be using an old GPU for reference. I mark the other side too, and then make the necessary cut. And after cleaning up the edges a bit with a sanding attachment, we can see that the GPU now fits alright. The I.O. frame also needs some more cutting this treatment, because we've got more material that we need to get rid of. So again, after a bunch of measurements and markings, I cut out the bits that were in the way of our new card slot, leaving a big gap in the I.O. frame. Next I spent some time measuring and prototyping some filler pieces using cardboard to cover up all the unwanted empty space. Here, you can see me cutting out one of the filler pieces from some scrap sheet metal. This one will cover the missing material between the I.O. shield cutout and the newly created PCIe slot. And although I tried really hard to apply the measure twice, cut once rule, measuring in fact about a dozen times in total, the part I made still needed lots of adjustment. Not only because the cardboard template didn't translate that well, but also because I don't really know what the heck I'm doing. Measure never, cut whatever is how we roll here at the repair lair. And here's what that looked like when finished. <laughs> Actually, it's not even that bad. I then repeated the process with the other prototype piece. It took absolutely forever, but I did get somewhere in the end. But before I show you the final results, we still have one last thing to take care of. The PSU mount. Of course, the original one was not ATX. So I decided to cut out a bunch of material and make a new mount. I made a template from some cardboard and tested the fit. Using the cardboard template as a guide, I cut out a rough version of the new panel and then proceeded to mark up the case material to be removed from around the original PSU hole. The big cuts were then made using an angle grinder, because I got sick of using the small Dremel cutting disc. I also snipped off most of the vent grill using some wire cutters, and then proceeded to clean up all the rough edges. Lastly, I used an old ATX PSU mount panel from an old case as a template. After some more cutting, drilling and adjusting, here's the final result. You can see here how I reattached all of the parts, screwing everything together with various nuts and bolts. And although it doesn't look stunning on the inside, the outside of the case looks genuinely good, and that's the important bit. I've also ground down the bolt ends that protrude above the height of the nuts, and although it doesn't look fantastic here, this section will be covered up by the side panel anyway. Before wrapping up, I also decided to give the case a good clean and thoroughly hose the case down. It looks pretty good, don't you think? With the mechanical part of the case modification now finished, it's time to take a look into modifying the electronics. Here we have one SAS backplane board from the server. A single one of these bad boys can support up to four hot swappable SAS disks. And I want to reuse it with a modern SAS card later, when rebuilding the server. Sadly, it has some weird non-standard power connector. Thanks IBM. However, some kind soul has measured the pins of the power cable and shared some info on his website, which I found earlier. 
Not only did he note that this connector uses just your regular 12, 5 and 3.3 volt rails, but also documented the pinout. What a saint. I decided to use this old semi-modular 500 watt Cooler Master PSU, which is gonna be good enough for now. And I'll be splicing the SAS backlink power cables onto the modular SATA power cables that come with this PSU. I started by cutting the cable off at the first SATA port, then stripped the individual wires and checked the pinout by turning on the PSU and poking around with my multimeter. Next, we cut off one end of the proprietary power cable and strip a bit of shielding off from all of the wires. With the cable now free from all the zip ties and with the ends exposed, I grouped the individual wires based on the pinout and labeled the groups accordingly. First, the 5 volt wires, then the 12 volt, and lastly, the 3.3 volt wires. As you might have guessed, the remaining unlabeled wires are all ground. After twisting the individual bundles together, I double check that the pinout matches. Just to be safe. As you can see here, I've decided to temporarily connect the SAS backplane to the motherboard with a single old SATA disk attached, just to check that everything works before soldering. And yeah, it looks like the disk is recognized. The PC did attempt to boot from the disk, but crashed, because all the hardware is all different than where this disk was originally in before. Next up, I disconnect the spliced cables so that I can tin all of the ends. The leftover flux residue is also cleaned off and some spade connectors are then crimped onto the ends. And although this is really hacky and far from optimal, the reason I'm doing this instead of just soldering the cables together is because I'm reasonably certain I will change the power supply in the near future. Using a permanent marker, I also note the voltages onto the spade connectors, so that I wouldn't need to keep the ugly paper labels around. I then slip on some pieces of heat shrink tubing, so that I can tidy everything up later. And then the same process is repeated on the second SAS cable. Before proceeding, I decided to again test the Franken cable that I've built, and actually do it a bit more properly this time round. I assembled the motherboard onto a cheap mining rig frame, and grabbed four 2TB Hitachi SAS drives to use with the SAS backplane. I then booted the system up from a flash drive, and sure enough, all four disks are detected without any issues. Once done with testing, I broke down the rig and then used the jet lighter on the heat shrink tubing. And with the cables now looking nice and pretty, we're done with the SAS backlane modification. The second wiring modification that needs doing is the splitting up of the proprietary power button and status LED connector. This thing absolutely, definitely, undeniably, most certainly is not ATX compatible. But thankfully what it is, is very, very long, containing many more pin slots than have actually been populated. Removing the connector pins allows me to then cut apart the long connector into four shorter individual connectors, each containing only two slots for pins. After sanding down the excess, the pins then get reinserted into the four new connectors. And as they're now individually split up, they can be used in any sort of configuration and can be attached to any desired motherboard. The final part that needs significant modification is the USB front panel connector. 
which is very nearly very ATX, but not quite. I started by comparing the pinout of the connector to another one I had from a proper ATX case. And thankfully, the adjustments needed here were quite simple. Firstly, I removed a single pin whose wire is strangely not connected to anything. And secondly, I relocated one of the blanking inserts to change the position of the key pin. Off camera I also cut away all the excess slots, sounded the sides and then used some more heat shrink tubing on the mystery pin. And since the cable for this USB panel is very short, I made an extension with which it should be able to reach the headers on the motherboard I'll be using. To give some more rigidity to the connection, I applied some electrical tape and then some heat shrink tubing too. Here you can see the finished product in all of its glory. And now that we've got everything ready, let's start the assembly process. To start off the build, I will reuse the motherboard, CPU and RAM combo you've seen already during the case modification. It's an old HP OEM thing with a 3rd gen i5 CPU and 8GB of RAM. I've also bought another 8GB stick which hasn't arrived yet. You might think this whole setup is not much. However, it's plenty powerful for what I want to do with this machine. Far more importantly though, it is still much newer and significantly more power efficient compared to the stuff that was in here originally. I'll be using this LSI 9207 SAS Hostbus adapter, which you already briefly saw before, for connecting the SAS backplanes. Note that these are designed to go into server cases with really strong airflow, so we'll need to add a fan to it later to make sure it doesn't overheat. With the dummy brackets now in place, I installed the PSU. And then the SAS backplane boards. After that was done, I connected the SAS backplane boards to the power supply using my DIY power cables. And I also then connected the SAS backplane boards to the LSI SAS card using the original cables that came with the server. And here's how it looks from the back so far. Not bad, although the extra PCI slot I made does look a bit wonky. Next I started populating all of the disk caddies. I will be using 6 2TB Hitachi 7200RPM SAS drives. Wow, I say that quickly 5 times. They're quite dated at this point, but good enough for me. And since only 2 caddies came with the machine, I also bought 6 new additional caddies. Two of which I'll use as blanks. After inserting the power button assembly and connecting up the USB front panel, I booted up Ubuntu again and started inserting disks one by one to see if they're all detected correctly. And sure enough, one by one they started appearing on the GNOME disk utility. I then spent some time designing some labels using Inkscape. And after that was done, I glued them on the disc caddies.
check it out. So professional. And after the main discs were all done, I decided to tackle the boot discs next. Due to the age of this case, there naturally weren't any two and a half inch disc mounting locations. Because of that, and because I wanted some more flexibility in the future, I bought a five and a quarter inch drive bay docking thing for two and a half inch drives. Basically just a miniature hot swap version of the SAS drive bays we've got on this case already. To store the operating system, I'll be using two identical 250 gig Samsung Pro SSDs, which I attach to the caddies and slide into the dock. I'll eventually have them set up in RAID 1 mirror configuration. And since we're only using two discs, and both of them are SSDs which barely make any heat anyway, I'll keep the fan off for now. To install the dock, I attach the toolless mounts that were originally used for the CD drive, and slide the dock into the bay until it gives out a satisfying click. I then installed a chassis fan at the back, and then went on to install a fan onto the LSI SAS card. Now because I'm paranoid, I also decided to change the thermal compound on the card while I'm here. The heatsink on this card was held on by two pushpins that can be popped out with a pair of needle nose pliers. And with the heatsink removed, I wiped off the old compound using some tissues and lighter fluid. After applying a bead of new compound, the heatsink is reattached. And we can now also attach the teeny tiny 40mm Noctua fan that I bought specifically for this card. Of course, we can't use the included rubber mounts here, and regular fan screws are too thick as well, so I found some other suitable small screws and washers. And after attaching the fan, the card can go back in again. Beautiful. Incredibly, this build is actually coming to a conclusion. And since the internal components are now all in place, I decided to stand the tower back up for the finishing touches. And man, what a hefty beast this tower is. It's like a Model M, just not a keyboard. I proceeded to attach the big side panel. And after that, the front panel. In fact, this is not the original panel that came with the server. I bought a new one, since the one that the server shipped with originally got damaged in transit. To wrap up, I want to install Proxmox on the server, but I'm not gonna bore you with the process. Instead, I just wanna film how cool the system looks when in operation. Before that, note how the power button is hidden deep behind the front panel, so you wouldn't click it by accident. I therefore have to use a screwdriver to power on the machine. I must say, I am very happy with how this modification turned out. The case looks incredible, and the front hexagon grid with the blinking LEDs behind it makes it look like a tiny mainframe that was just taken out from the data center. I'm also very happy to have the opportunity and means to put this case back in use and save it from certain death at a recycling center. And there you go. That is how you make a new server out of an old server. Sort of. You might be wondering why I'm filming myself talking here in this random corner, and the reason for that is I can't be bothered to actually bring this thing back upstairs just for filming the outro. It might look quite small in this picture, but it weighs a ton and it's absolutely massive. Here's some more footage of how the finished case looks though. The front panel LEDs and power button work well. The USB ports are operational and the 2.5 inch hot swap bays 
look almost as if they were originally bundled with this machine all those years ago. The expansion in the back is, well, limited, but it's only due to the motherboard choice, which I will upgrade later. I also got some longer SAS cables and did some cable management so it all looks just a bit tidier inside. As you may have noticed though, I have not reused the original fan frame to add extra case fans. For the moment I believe the airflow is adequate. The SAS drives I got in here are rated for 60 degrees during continuous operation and even under heavy sustained load, the temperature readings never went above 60 during my testing. And that's all I have for this time. Since you've watched this far, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. I hope this video was informative and entertaining, and I'll see you again very soon.